Our second reading is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5. Jesus continues teaching the crowd. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how can it, its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything but is thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hidden. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it under the bushel basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come not to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one letter, not one stroke of a letter will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. God's word is life. Thanks be to God. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world, Jesus says, to those gathered around to listen to him and learn from him. This is what he so often does. He picks up on features from everyday living and uses those to take you somewhere, somewhere beneath the surface to somewhere radical, as in root, rooted in our life with God. You are the salt of the earth, he says getting us thinking about ourselves as salt, that basic, not fancy, but rather magical ingredient. How it only takes just a very little to transform the whole, creating something all that much more flavorful, desirable. And just who is it that he's speaking to there? From what we gather in Matthew's Gospel, it's this crowd of many of them broken people. People who are bringing their broken, ailing friends and loved ones to him for healing. These are people ground down by oppressive systems and policies and rulers, even some of their own people. It's what happens when you live in an occupied territory. And Jesus says to them, you are the salt of the earth. Fat chance, we might hear them say, murmuring among themselves. Maybe Jesus hears it too, and so he runs with it. If salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything, but is thrown out and trampled underfoot. Ah, man, now you're talking, the crowd erupts, like they were some Southern Baptist congregation. (laughs) These people who know what it is to be trampled underfoot. How it is a people can lose their essence, their verve, their transformative value and purpose. They're with him now. Except that he goes on, like he's not prepared to take back what he first declared, you are salt of the earth. And so he lands another one. You are the light of the world. And before they have a chance to argue, he goes on, a city built on a hill cannot be hid. So now we're talking about visibility, exposure, vulnerability, illumination. No one lights a lamp, he says, and then hides it, but sets it up on a stand so it gives light to all in the house in the same way. Let your light shine before others 
so they may see your good works and give glory to God. I've always understood this passage to be speaking about our gifts, our God-given talents, and the encouragement then not to hide them. How it can happen that because of modesty or shyness or fear we hold back. But this time I'm hearing that the light is not something we have, but who we are. So Jesus isn't talking about hiding a thing. He's talking about hiding ourselves. Shine, he's saying. Show up for God's sake. Let your lives be seen so that your presence, through that, another person's world may open up to the wonder of God's presence. This is what comes out all the more when we hear the voice of the prophet Isaiah alongside. And what's the thing he's so eager to convey? All those pious practices you're about, they don't matter a whit to God, he says, when you neglect your neighbor, when you hide yourselves from those with whom you are bound in this covenant of love. On Friday night, I went to see the movie Harriet. I wonder if you've had a chance to see it. Yeah. It's the story of Harriet Tubman, that young slave girl who ran for freedom only to become this force for the freedom of others through what we now know as the Underground Railroad. There's this scene in the movie where Harriet is with this large gathering of deeply concerned people in this palatial room inside what I think is the residence of a government official. These people are black and white, involved in some way in the Underground Railroad. By the way they're dressed, you get the sense that it's kind of a gathering of the elite. It is very soon after a law has been passed declaring that slaves who have escaped to freedom are no longer protected in the free states like Pennsylvania, where Harriet herself ran to. So now the so-called railroad would have to reach all the way to Canada. And where Harriet had been making a way for people across 100 miles, now the journey would be 500 miles. As everyone in the room is beginning to absorb the details, you see them shaking their heads. There's just no way. It's too far. We can't do that. And then you see Harriet step forward. And raising her voice, she says something to the effect of, it's only too far if you've never been a slave. But I've been a slave, she says, owned by somebody, used and abused. And she goes on to paint just enough of the harsh, barbaric picture and reminds everyone that right now there are people who are living that right now. Because of them, she says, this journey is not too far. It can't be too far. And then you see the nods beginning to happen all around the room, like a whole new awareness has just dropped into the depths of their beings. And there's this resolve to find a way. That's salt. That's light. That's light breaking forth like the dawn, as Isaiah puts it. All those people gathered in that room, they're good people. Their heart's in the right place, they care. They're on the side of freedom. And the journey was going to be too far. Until they heard, really heard, 
from Harriet with their hearts. Sometimes that's what it takes. We make a move, an essential move, not by doubling down on our will to do gooder, but by undergoing yet another conversion, by getting close enough to, to see and to hear with our hearts. So we might ask ourselves, what are we doing? Where are we placing ourselves? such that our passion for life is ignited. And we ourselves are set free, free enough from our own self-concern that we do not hide from our own kin, but reach out, connect, care. For 50 years now, we have known, our governments have known about grassy narrows. And many other communities of indigenous people where the water is not safe for drinking. This is Canada. And the word is out, and it has been for some time, that indigenous communities receive far less funding for child support services than non-indigenous communities. Communities where the need is all the greater and the cost for delivering these services is much higher, yet the funding, the support, is woefully inadequate. Where are we placing ourselves that our passion might be ignited? Cindy Blackstock, for whom this is her whole deal, she's coming to Victoria on March the 2nd, speaking at the Reconciliation Dialogue event hosted uh, by uh, our city council. The details of that event are printed already in that printed announcement page that you have. The Tech Frontier Mine, the largest tar sands ever proposed, that if built would lock us into decades of new oil extraction. Do you know about this? It's actually being considered as a real live proposal right now by our federal government, a decision to come at the end of this very month. What about this covenant of love in which we are bound with our neighbors? Neighbors that include generations that are not yet born. Neighbors that include the earth herself and all earth's creatures. Where are we placing ourselves? Shine. Show up for God's sake. Let your lives be seen, Jesus says. Do not hide from your own kin, but reach out, connect, care. It is in doing this that our light breaks forth like the dawn, Isaiah tells us. And not only that, he announces that in doing so, our healing will happen. And still not only that, your vindicator, he continues, shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Get it? Before and behind. Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry for help, and God will say, here I am. In other words, we are not alone as we commit to the welfare of one another. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world, Jesus says now to us. And while it might not be possible to restore saltiness to salt, just maybe by God's grace, a people can be reinvested with its essence, its transformative purpose. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. You are agents of transformation, Jesus tells us, names us, reminds us. Don't go searching for it. It's in you to be this. It's who we are. What a time to be alive in our world. 
with all its troubles right now, what a time to be part of the turning of the tide. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. In first century Galilee, Jesus didn't have in mind football stadium floodlights, but a flame. How one candle in a darkened room transforms the whole space. We're not the whole deal. Never meant to be. Salt and light is enough, so long as that is who we are. It has been given to us to make a life-giving difference. What a time to be alive in our world. Thanks be to God. Amen.